past couple of weeks, my printer's been printing out about double or triple. I, what I tell it to is not counting. Well, I said, well, maybe it's, it's lack of faith, but maybe we'll need that many. But anyway, <laughs> we've got a bunch of extra copies of our scriptures this morning that we plan to uh, utilize here. And I've entitled our message this morning, Simple Question, Is There Not Another Way? Is There Not Another Way? We have the story of Naaman, a great story and a, and a, a lot to learn and glean from those scriptures. So we'll read beginning in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper, had the disease of leprosy. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. She said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord well, with the prophet that is in Samaria, for well, he would recover him of this leprosy. Hey, if you could meet the prophet Elisha, he could heal Naaman. Verse 4, And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid, that is of the land of Israel, and of the king of Israel said, Go to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel, he departed and took him, with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh to quarrel against me. That, <laughs> he's trying to stir up trouble because he knows I can't heal. Verse 8, and it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard the king, that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent messenger unto him, saying, Naaman, go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. You'll be healed of this dreaded disease of leprosy. Verse 11. But Naaman was wroth and went away. And said, Behold, I thought he will surely come up to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leprosy. Thought he'd do it my way. Then he said, Are not Abana and Farfar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away again in rage. Man, he was upset. He was mad. And the servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet Elisha 
had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he said that he go wash in Jordan and be clean? I mean, he, it's a simple thing he's asked you to do. Go to Jordan, duck seven times, and you'll be clean. Verse 14 says, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the river Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Think about that a moment. The flesh of, of a little child is just something about it, isn't it? It's just precious. And that's what happened to Naaman, finally. But Naaman had asked a question, may I not wash in the rivers of Damascus and be clean? It's like asking, is there another name, another place, Another time, rather than what you've requested of me. And think about it. It was a very simple thing, wasn't it? To do what Elisha said do. But now let's think about it. Here Naaman was. He possessed many great qualities. The scripture bears this out. He was captain of the king of hosts. He was a great man with his master, and he was mighty in valor. But he had the dreaded disease called leprosy. I took time out in preparing for this message to read up again on leprosy. I've kept some articles over the years. I had a school teacher that was very sold on uh, the treatment of leprosy uh, many years ago. There was a place over in Louisiana, not far from Baton Rouge, called Carville. James Carville, they pressed the man and the politician, unfortunately a Democrat, <laughs> grew up a mile and a half from the treatment center called Carville. That's where it got his it's named from James Carville's great-grandfather. In 1894, they established it to treat leprosy. And I'm sure you've seen some pictures over the years of people that had that dreaded disease of leprosy. A finger, they say, would just fall off. But in the Bible, God gave a number of laws to control the disease of leprosy. Matter of fact, if you had a red space come up on your skin somewhere and it looked questionable, you were to be put outside the camp for seven days where you could be observed to see if maybe you had leprosy. They didn't want to spread that dreaded disease. Now, so you'll know, in our modern day, they call it Hansen's disease. Still, they say that each year in the United States, there's some 200 people that wind up with leprosy. The good news is, 2015, they closed the town or the treatment center in Carville no longer need it because they have medications now that they can treat leprosy with. By the way, of, of interest to you, uh, in this article I was reading last night again, says the way that a person, a human being, contacts leprosy is through an animal. Anybody want to tell me what animal? Armadillo. Armadillo. I thought, well, that was, that was fiction, but that's what it says on the Internet, that it's still spread by armadillo. Uh, so <laughs> stay away from armadillos. 
but it was a dreaded disease. Matter of fact, if you had it in years gone by, and by the way, that treatment center started in 1894. The government took it over in 1921. But if someone had leprosy, it, it was kind of a shame. They would go there and be banished from their family from now on. But this is what Naaman was afflicted with, with leprosy. You and I think of the big C word, don't we? We think of cancer. Uh, we hear it much more common because you hear it daily. In Bible days, leprosy was a very common thing. But thank the Lord he's provided a, a means now where people can live with leprosy. In this case of Naaman, he'd been told by Elijah the prophet, if you go dip seven times in the river Jordan, you'll be healed. Boy, he just couldn't stand that. <laughs> well, I got two, we got two better rivers over here in Syria or, or Damascus. And what y'all got in, the, in all of Israel? He didn't want to do what God said do. That's the point. So he refused initially to go until they reasoned with him. They said, if the prophet had asked you to do something, great you would have done it in order to be healed but here he just simply go to Jordan and dip seven times finally persuaded he got a new lease on life didn't he but sinners dislike God's plan for salvation if you will, look at your paper. They do not like Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. They don't like that verse. Sinners don't. And neither do they like verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. That's unanimous, isn't it? And then at verse 19. Now we know that all, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The Bible says if we have no, say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But sinners don't like that. And then if you will, look at the back of your page there. The Titus chapter 3 verse 5. Top of your page. The back side. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Oaked is not by works of righteousness which 
we do. Or have done. There's a man in the Bible called the rich young ruler and came to Jesus. He said to Jesus, good master, what good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, why callest thou me good? There's none good. Not one. But if you want to work your way into heaven, go ahead and keep all the commandments. And he said, which? And, he, and the Lord told him which one of the, he named the commandments down. And he said, oh, I've kept all them all my life. Since I was a youth, I've kept all the commandments. And the Lord told him, one of those commandments, thou shalt not lie or bear false witness. Thou shalt not steal. Who among us can say they've never lied? But this man said, oh, I've kept all your commandments from the time I've been a little boy. <laughs> little boy is sin worse than all of them. <laughs> That's why little boys need to... Uh, all the chastisement they can get. I did myself. And I had a mama that loved me that knew how to do it. <laughs> the point being is, we've all sinned. But the rich young ruler wanted another way. A very successful guy. Um, he was young, he was rich, but he didn't want to listen to the instruction from the Lord. The Lord told him, sons, go sell what you got. Give it to the poor. And come follow me. Y'all remember what happened? Matthew 19, one of the cases is three times in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't include it in his gospel. But the story is given of the rich young ruler. The scripture says when the Lord told him to go sell what you got and give it to the poor and follow me, that the man turned away sorrowful and went his own way. According to what record we have, the man wound up in hell, didn't he? All the riches he had here that he didn't want to give to the poor were of no avail, especially for him to reject God's way. It's easy for pride to get in the way, but this seems to be the case of the rich young ruler. Satan has a stumbling block for every person and every occasion. He knows what will keep one from Christ, and brother, he uses them. Anything he can to keep people from being saved. There was a man in power in Paul's day by the name of Felix. And Felix was witnessing, was being witnessed to by Paul, and Paul was telling him about the Lord. And look, if you will, look at Acts 24, verse 25. And as he, Paul, reason of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered to Paul, Paul, go thy way for this time, and when I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. You know, that's Satan's Conway of keeping people from Christ. I'll get around to it later. Paul, I'll call for you. He trembled at what he heard. He believed it, but not enough that he was willing to commit his life to Christ. Didn't deny his need for salvation, but he wanted it at his time, not God's. 
And we ask the question, when is it time to be saved? When you feel conviction. When you feel you need to commit your life. And if you don't do it, the fault becomes your fault, not God's. The Pharisees that came and prayed with the publican. The Pharisee said, Lord, thank you that I'm not as other men, that I do good and I pay tithes and all this. Lord, thank you for what I do. That's what he was saying. Lord, thank you that I'm better than other men. I'm not as other men are. I'm a good guy. Lord, you ought to recognize that. And now the old Republican, <laughs> I take that re off. The old public and the tax collector simply said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Lord heard that prayer. He was like the thief on the cross, wasn't he? <coughs> Lord, have mercy on me. And folks, that's what we ask for, isn't it? And that's what we receive if we ask. But the Pharisee didn't like God's way. They felt no need for repentance. The folk, the publican, gladly received his word. But I asked the question as we consider the story of Naaman. Why do sinners seek another way? The answer, because they're blinded by Satan. And if you will, look back at your paper. John 3, verse 19. And this is a condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. What did that say? Because men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are for evil. The flesh cries out for things to satisfy it. Contrary to the spirit. The truth is it has to be done God's way. God told Naaman, go dip seven times in Jordan and you'll be healed. And that was offensive. Brother Enrique mentioned in Sunday school this morning about believing. Folk, if, if we don't believe, we can forget it. Can we? But in John 3, verse 18, if you will, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But people say that, that that's just too simple. Folk, I'm glad the Lord made it for simple people. Amen. <laughs> Where we could understand it and receive it. There's nothing nothing difficult about taking Jesus as your Savior. And that's what we're asked to do. Either you take him or you don't. We get to make the choice. And we make the choice. We may be wind up like Felix and say, hey, go your way for right now. 
Paul, and I'll, I'll call for you at a convenient time when I get ready. All right, the last verse on your paper, John 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It says had. Now, now, maybe so, or we might get it, but you have it. But then he said, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. As I've started to say earlier, Brother uh, Enrique, talking about believing in God, some people say, Well, I just believe there's a God. And I remind you, the scripture says the devils believe there's a God. Satan does, and he trembles. Like Felix trembled. The devils know there's a God, and they know their time is limited, and one of these days they're going to be cast into the fiery pit and be there forever. They know that. So they believe there's a God. But I read the old bits maybe sometimes too much, but I've always questioned, you know, <laughs> what people say about their loved ones when they die. If they wasn't a member of the church, they'll say, well, he was of the Baptist faith or Methodist faith or something to that effect. He almost made it. <laughs> But people who write those remarks after their loved ones are gone want to honor the person. But every now and then you see one that doesn't mention any relationship to God at all. But folks, you have a relationship with God one way or another. Either you know him or you don't. It's not hard to understand, is it? Either you believe him or you don't believe him. But I'm going to be like Peter told the Lord when the Lord said, Peter, you're going to turn away from him as, as the others have left? And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of eternal life. Think about it a moment. What, where does a person go that turns away from Christ? Into an eternity apart from God forever. Now think about that. Your mind can't absorb it. Mind can't. Of an eternity. But folks, we live in an eternal state. We were made in the image of God. And that when God made us in his image, he gave us an eternal soul or spirit. And it's going to live with God or apart from him. But he wants you to come unto him. That's why he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and a lowly of heart. 